There was a guy that was an old family friend. He wound up being my high school football coach. He left teaching to come down to the Merck and he did really well. And his brother was on the floor. That's how he got on the floor. And his name was Orv Wilkin. And um, he's one of the funniest people I've ever met in my entire life. His badge was ORV. He died in um, 2001, October of 01. Um, weird disease. but. He used to bring guys on the floor, and um, he told he would try to get me a job when I was in college. But I needed to make money, and you made you know a hundred bucks a week as a runner. I couldn't do it, and there was a hiring freeze at the Merck at the time because the S and P pit had expanded and the floor was crowded. And then um, I was thought about it after college, but I was so broke, I needed some money, and so I went to work for 3M. And I literally, one of the guys that I grew up with kind of helped some Italian people out on Thursdays at a bar paying and collecting football bets. And Orv was a big gambler. Orv comes walking up to me and he says, what are you doing here? And I said, what are you doing here? And we started laughing and he says, why don't you just come down to the floor? He says, you'll be a great spreader. I'll have you making a hundred grand a year in three months. And I said, done. I walked in, I quit my job on Monday. Got a job as a runner with Stotler for 150 bucks a week gross. My father-in-law was absolutely apeshit. How can you marry this idiot? My wife backed me, thank God. She was living in Dallas at the time. I had to move back home like everybody else, right? You go yeah, 150 bucks a week gross with nothing. Um, and then I got a clerk job with Norm Seltzer in the Euro Dollar Options that Orb found me. That was 200 a week, and then Roger Carlson hired me for 400 a week to be his clerk. He was a local, and Roger was the first guy ever to figure out um, how to move from Chicago to London to Singapore and pass the book. So I worked for Roger, and then Roger backed me, and then eventually I went on my own. I went to three colleges in four years. I was a basketball recruit at the Air Force Academy, uh, went out there, didn't like it, got really homesick, came back, went to a junior college, played ball there. Then I went to Illinois, um, and my dad was, uh, you know, a school teacher at, at Triton. Um, and um, he's like, you should be an accountant, you know. It's like, okay. So I took uh, accounting at Triton, and I got straight A's and went to U of I and took a me intermediate finance, you know. I'm in the College of Business down there, which is a good school. Accounting program at the time, number one in the country. And I got a D in an uh, intermediate. I didn't know how to drop a class, you know. It just wasn't in my in my thing. Like, you don't drop. You just keep working at it, right? And so uh, I figured out pretty quick I wasn't going to do that. And uh, so I was talking to this train conductor to go to my uncle's house for Thanksgiving. And I talked my way out of the train without paying any money. And my mom said, you should go into sales. <laughs> So I decided to major in marketing, and I went into sales for 3M. That was my job. First one, Roger gave me his IMM. Um, I traded on that. When I went on my own, I bought an IMM, and almost immediately after buying it, a friend of mine in the pit wanted to buy a membership, but he wanted to buy an IMM, and I really wanted a CME. What we did was we did the swap, and I swapped up to a CME for 50000 What's an even better story is this guy, John Bailey, was a great trader and a mentor of mine in the Euro dollars, huge trader. And he wanted to sell me his house and his membership. His house was on Lake Michigan in Wilmette, right by, uh, what is that, Plaza del Lago. And he goes, I'll sell you the house and the membership for like a million dollars or a million two or something. I'll finance it all for 12%. He says, don't worry about how much money you're putting down. 
at the end of a year, you're a good enough trader, you'll have enough money, you'll be able to get a seat loan and the house loan, and, and I'm out. So we went to his accountant, Sandy Levin, who a lot of guys used, and he told this scheme to Sandy, and Sandy says, John, do you own another membership? And John's like, nope. And he goes, you can't do this deal because if this kid busts out, you, you have no recourse. And John says, I can't do it. And I said, I got an accountant. So Sandy's still my accountant. And, um, and then I came here and I got a loan for 275 at a point over prime, pay it off in five years, the classic trader loan. Um, and from Jan Colo at BMO Harrison, they're still my bank. Uh, so I'm loyal, if nothing else. It's a physical business. Uh, you're a big guy. I'm a big guy. You know, you'd have back pain. I, I, I had some back stuff. There was a napropath, I think, in the Board of Trade or the Merck that people used to go to. Um, I went to a back doctor. Uh, my neck would stiffen up. Unfortunately, I do yoga now. Um, Iyengar yoga. And I, I would have been in a lot better shape if I would have done that then. Um, you know, I was athletic. So I rode my bike, ran, you know, stuff like that, lifted weights. But what people don't understand about trading is like stand for six hours in one spot every day and have somebody just push you or nudge you around a little bit every day and then scream and yell like for a little bit and then shut up and try to keep your mind busy and engaged and then scream and yell. I mean, it's tough. I think the physical toll is, is hard, but the mental toll of keeping your head in the game and not making mistakes is, is hard. Um, and, and now that I work with entrepreneurs, I, I just had a conversation about that. It's just like the mental game is tough. And, um, you know, a lot of people we know killed themselves. I, I think I know 20 uh, after the floors closed. So it's a tough game. My dad was not happy about it. Um, it's a risky thing. He was more of a risk-averse person. Um, my mother didn't care so much. My sisters were younger than me. They didn't know. Um, more was impactful. I was engaged. And my in-laws were like, how do you give up this corporate career? It's our daughter. It's our only daughter. For Take a shot at this, you know. If it didn't work out, I felt confident enough in myself as a person that I could find another job and make a living. I mean, um, I think that's one thing that, the trading floor is underrated on. Uh, the skills that people learn do transfer to other things, especially selling. And I was a salesman before I went down, and I think when you were in the pit, you had to sell yourself a little bit. In the mid-90s, after I got stung a little bit, I got a little more risk-averse. And so I needed to take more risk than I did. Um, and then... Getting involved in Merck politics was sort of probably good for my ego, good for the Merck at the end of the day, but bad for the family because I probably missed out like starting an electronic trading firm. Instead of being one of the guys fighting the fight at that board level, being a part of the evolution, um, I think would have been infinitely more satisfying than where I wound up. Lost money. In 03, I lost money first time ever. And that's when the Euro dollars went electronic. So it was like December of 03. I wasn't, I was depressed. Talking to Bill Shepard and he said, go down to the hogs. I went down to the hogs, not electronic. Did really well until they went electronic. And then um, the fact that you couldn't manage trades the risk was higher, um, you basically lost your speed edge, it just became very, very difficult for me. Love the people. I love the uh, energy and stuff, but like specific ones like the first time you walked on it ever, like, and then that was cool. But the first time you ever walked on as a member, that was really cool because you were like a member and the noise. Just loved it. And the smell, I loved that. And just the energy, the fact that you could walk into a pit and just like do something by yourself. Um, I really miss it. Um, I don't wake up dreaming about it anymore, you know.
sometimes people I know I wake up dreaming like, oh shit, I got to go do out trades or whatever. And there's certain, I mean, there's a, the thing that people don't realize is today, like coming up sort of the millennial generation is there's crappy parts of every job, right? So there's always people that you didn't get along with or that you didn't want to be around, but you had to because they worked there too and you had to get along, you know? And so everything's so like polarized now. Um, and everybody wants it all in the beginning. Um, in the trading community, you could maybe if you, you know, you had a big enough backer, you could trade big enough, but you, a lot of times you had to work into that and you had to mentally get comfortable with it and physically get comfortable with it. And, um, and you had clearinghouse that said, no, 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 you can't, can't do that. Um, and so you had to sort of earn your stripes as you went up. Um, and the other thing I really, really, um, valued from the trading floor, the fact that your word is your bond and I don't know you. But we just traded, and because you had a badge and I had a badge, and we checked the trade, the trade is the trade, and that's it, right? And you walked away. And, you, and I found doing deals with traders was always great because there was no bullshit. But if you screwed somebody over, everybody knew about it, and they drummed you out of the pit. You couldn't make a living anymore. I think people think about the trading industry, and they think about what Hollywood portrays it like. Um, and it's all about hookers and blow. And I really hate that because it, it, sure, there were hookers and blows and drugs and stuff. But, you know, I saw some people do some pretty amazing things to help other people out. And I saw some crazy stuff like, uh, you know, I, I don't know what was bet $100,000 on whether Chris Lane could throw a clincher softball across the river or not. You know, and the whole place cleared out and stopped traffic on Monroe. And he did it. But, you know, stupid stuff like that that built camaraderie, um, that had nothing to do with sort of illicit activity. More money was raised off trading floors for Chicago charities than probably anywhere else. And then if you think of the history of the Board of Trade and the Merck, um, the Board of Trade built the Art Institute. Without the Board of Trade, she doesn't, Bertha Palmer doesn't get the money. She can't go to France and buy all those paintings. And by the way, the, um, a lot of the architectural buildings were financed by traders. Without it, it's not there. If you walk it in, uh, what is it now, Wintrust Bank, and walk into their lobby, it used to be Continental. That was the trader's bank. The reason it's so ornate is because all their money went there. It was never stressful. It wasn't like, like when I think about stressful, I think about like people going crazy and high blood pressure. and It was just like, once you, if you were in a flow, and you were going, it was great because stuff would come in, boom, 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 and you were just in a flow. I met interesting people. Sometimes the conversations were bullshit. I learned a lot of trivia that I probably wouldn't have learned. Um, <laughs> but it was just, it was like going to work anywhere else where, you know, you were part of the community, but you had your place. And then you had to carve out a niche for yourself. Order fillers would know to look for you for certain things. Some traders were bigger than other traders and, you know, some traders tried to help. You know, it just, there's all different kinds of people and that, the diversity of people, there wasn't diversity of skin color per se, but there was just a totally melting pot of people. Like you could be next to a Harvard PhD and then the other guy on your other side could be a guy that didn't graduate from high school. Unlimited, depending on how much risk you wanted to take and how much capital you had. I mean, for me, as a kid that grew up, you know, Lombard Villa Park, Illinois, uh, I never thought I'd have that kind of opportunity. I mean, you know, I remember the first time I made $500 in a day, and it was just like, oh, my God, I just made $500. I mean, I couldn't do that pumping gas. I remember once in the hogs, there was nobody there on the close. <laughs> There was literally, everybody was gone, and I was, there were like five of us in the pit, and I had this spread on, and it was one of those where you didn't have pieces of shit on each end of the stag, gold. One went up, one went down, and I think I made 150000 in like 20 seconds or something. And I remember once in the Euro dollars, it was like everything came together for me, and I just knew it. And I just looked around the pit and I just went, buy them, buy them, buy them, buy them. And your dollar's not small, right? So these are, you know, a couple hundred here, 500 here, whatever. 
And this guy grabbed me by the back of my neck like this. And he pulled me over. He goes, sold as many as you want. And I looked at him. I went, a thousand. And I turned around. And I waved to the front to spread them off, you know. And the guy looks at me. And by the time I spread them off, I was up like a quarter million on the trade. And um, so that was a pretty good day. And the blood drained out of this guy's face. And I just checked it. And a thousand. <laughs> I'm making sure and it was 10 points lower than here, yeah. you know, but then you had other ones that were not good. Yeah. Um, so I, I have had those too. I thought I had the life licked and I put this spread on, on unemployment and I lost, uh, I think I lost 350 G in like, I don't know, two minutes or something like that. It was bad. Uh, I had to take out a loan again on my seed and pay it off. And then you had days like, you knew you were going to take a hickey because of the position you had. And so it was just like, how do I figure this out? Can I spread them off? Do I blow out? You know, what, what should I do? Um, trying to solve that problem. I remember once in, in the hogs, I had a spread, had an eight, 80 spreads on. And I, I knew the market was going to go up. I just felt it, it, that it was going to go up. And so I bought the short leg on the open. And I didn't trade the whole day. I just waited and watched the pit. And I watched the pit and I watched the pit. And on the close, I sold the 80 and scratched. <laughs> and I was like, that's a great day. Yeah. I didn't make any money, but that's a great day. In the beginning, it was just scalping, scalp spreads. I traded fronts to backs in the euro dollars because nobody else was. So I could make a market and add some value. At the time, nobody was really trading like red, March, red, March or anything. At the end, I was a position trader, which I liked and didn't like. I mean, 2008, having a big hog position was a little slick. <laughs> <laughs> when you thought, oh my God, if all hog breaks loose, I could really lose a lot of money. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. I just traded the market. I think markets break faster than they rally. Um, so I always sort of liked being short if it was right. Um, I was more of a contrarian, I think. Uh, if everybody was bullish, I'd be bearish and vice versa. <laughs> In the S&Ps, I was trading spreads and I thought I did an 80 lot spread and it was an outright 80 lot. And I went to sleep. I was sleeping. Somebody tried to check the trade like five hours later, and I was up a lot of money. <laughs> um, I had one because different pits had different culture. And so in the euro dollars, you didn't have to put size on. You could just say at five, whatever. Um, and then people say how many, 100, 200, whatever. Um, in the hogs, you had to put the size on. So I was brand new to the hogs. I go down there, and um, I was long a four lot because I was just kind of messing around trying to learn how the market traded. And Gilly Goodman comes in and he goes, what's here? And I went, at a half. And Greg Antonucci went, at a half. And he said, 50, 50. And then this other guy, Brad Warner Wyo, says, what's here, guys? 60 on 10, 70 on 10, 80 on 10, 90 on 10. What's here? What's here? And I'm just sitting there and I looked at John Connolly and I said, okay, John, I get it. I'm learning my lesson. How much money am I out? He goes, oh, maybe 16, 18 grand. I go, okay, fine. I've learned, I've learned my lesson, put size on it. Um, and then I looked at Bobby Henner and I said, what should I do? And he says, well, what do you got? And I showed him and he goes, go write up an order ticket. I said, okay. So I punched an order ticket and he goes, you just spread them off. And he goes, buy these over here. And I go, I don't know how to buy it. And he goes, I'll buy them for you. And he walked over and he bought them. And so I had the spread. Now I had the spread on. <laughs> so I'm out on this side, 18,000. I, I get this. And by the end of the day, it was up like 2,000 bucks on him. And, um, and, and I got out of the spreads. And then Bobby says, put this pork belly spread on. And so I did. So I walked over there and put a pork belly spread on. And by the end of the day, that day, I was up like 1,500. Then I went to get out of them, and I lost like 2,500. So <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, that's what it was like. It was pretty funny. Loved them. Uh, always a bit of tension, kind of like... The uh, easiest thing I could say is like before a game, right? So you're waiting for the tip off. Uh, the, the, the starting lineups have been introduced. You're on the court and you're just waiting for that ball to go up. And, um, you know, it changed over time. So 
in the early days of sort of the euro dollars, you'd look at what the London market was doing and it would kind of give you an indication. It wasn't perfect. It wasn't perfect because um, it would move around and stuff. But you get an indication and you'd look at where you were at and stuff. Um, and, of course, uh, you'd look at where the currencies were and, and try to get a feel. And then um, people would just be like, what's here? And nobody would really show sort of what they had. Um, and then the bell would ring and off, off you go. Um, in the hogs, it was different. They would say, you know, I think we're going to open here. And then people would say, well, I got a, I got a few to sell down here. And it, or I got a few to buy or whatever. And a few might mean, you know, 30, 40 cars or whatever. And if somebody had a lot, they'd go, you know, I, I got a few to buy. And uh, I don't think we're going to open 40 higher. We're going to open 100 higher. And then, oh, you know, and then the bell would ring and off we'd go. In the hogs, when I first started trading them, because in the euro dollars, there's always Singapore to get out of, right? And in the hogs, I started trading. And it's like 1 o'clock and the bell rings. And it's like, you know, the bell rang. That's it. And I'm like, oh, crap. And I said, when can I get out of these? And they're like, tomorrow morning at 9.05. <laughs> and so, I, you know, you just had them and you learn. We did stupid stuff. Crossword puzzles, trivia games, make bets. Um, you could go play hearts. There was always a hearts game around. You could play at some clearing firm somewhere. Sometimes you just went and played video games or you watch TV. Uh, some guys had golf things in there, so you'd go up and, and do that. Never drank. Some guys would go drinking. Um, I wasn't a drinker during the day. Um, we had a rule of one drink, you never went back. I did it once. I made money. I didn't like it. <laughs> it was stupid. Um, how did you work the brokers? Just tried to be buddies with them, try to help them out. They were my customers, and so I tried to service their needs, basically. Um, and if I couldn't, I tried to help them out. I always felt like if they were doing good, I was doing good. I never counted anybody else's money. Um, I competed and tried to get on trades, but there was usually enough there so you could get as much as you really wanted. Nothing's free. There is no free lunch. you got to work at it. Um, without taking risk, you're not going to go anywhere. Um, you don't win without trying. You have to try, and if you try, you're going to fail, and you're going to fail a lot. Um, so you got to be able to pick yourself up and overcome that. The other interesting thing that I think Chicago traders get that not a lot of people get is they have a keen sense of how much risk they can take at any one time, and that when they fail – there's a way to come back. And in New York, I don't think it's like that so much. And so you sort of saw that in 08, right? They all went broke and all the Chicago guys didn't go broke. And I think they just don't know how to calibrate risk. It's more, it's more gluttony, like just more and more and more. Orv Wilkin was the first one because um, he was my football coach and brought me down. He was funny. Oh, God. And so you, never, you could never lose your sense of humor. Different people in the pit mentored me in different ways. Um, I was lucky to work for a good guy, uh, Roger Carlson. He was great. So I remember once I lost 25,000 bucks. And I went up to the office. And I was all depressed. And I said, he said, what's wrong? I said, well, I took a shot at Fed time. Didn't work out. Lost 25,000. He goes, oh. And I was waiting for him to lower the boom on me, right? And he said, keep trading. Just keep trading. And then when I wanted to go on my own, he helped me. He was backing me. It was going to hurt him for me to leave. He helped me through the process and gave me, like, to this day, I can call Roger on the phone. Um, Bill Shepard was a tremendous mentor. Um, <laughs> just, just wise beyond belief. Um, and then you'd have different people in the pit mentor you at different times. John Bailey was great. He took me under my wing, under his wing, and, you know, um, kind of said stuff. But there were other people, Jeff Bernanke and um, Julie Vukin and um, different brokers, you know, Westcott and Richard Casper. They were nice, you know. 
Um, even Mike Walsh, uh, one and two lot trader that uh, I clerked for, him and Rich and I were, were great people and just, you know, nice to be around um, and kind of showed you the ropes a little bit. Uh, you know, I thought they were pretty full of themselves. Um, I, I thought, um, you know, they had the bonds, which was good, good contract, but, and they had the grains, which is great contracts and, and stuff. I just thought they were pretty full of themselves. They didn't respect us. Familiarity, probably. If I was in the board of trade side, I would have felt the same about the Merck. You know, who's this little person over here, you know? Um, I think the history behind the two exchanges is phenomenal. Chicago wouldn't be here without the Board of Trade. It was miserable. I lost money um, in 09, first time since 03. And then I couldn't make money in 10, couldn't make money in 11, couldn't make money in 12, so I quit. Didn't know what I was going to do. At that point, I had an MBA. Um, I had started Hyde Park Angels um, with a couple classmates. And I really wanted to go in the venture business. I was told by several people I wasn't qualified to be in the venture business. Um, and then, you know, a couple people started a fund in Chicago and kind of aced me out of it. Um, that was sort of my idea. So I was stuck because I, the network that I had had been blown up. So there was no trading floor. So if this would have been 1994 and I wanted to start a venture fund, I'd have walked on the floor. I'd have raised $25, $50 million in two weeks because guys would have had the ready capital and off I would have gone. I had saved a lot of money, fortunately. Um, I was pretty frugal um, with it. And, you know, my wife um, was patient with me. She didn't leave me. A lot of people, like when the money ran out, their wives left them. That made it worse. You know, you muddle through, and then I finally met my partner, um, who's my partner today, Kenny Estes, who's 34. Ironically, one of the early employees at Getco. When we pitched to people, I'd say, yeah, I was a trader, but he put me out of a job. He's never been on a trading floor in his entire life. Now, never will. Um, he uh, is 34 with two little kids. I'm 57 now with two old kids, one at Northwestern Law and one working for a startup. So very different uh, skill sets and stuff, which is actually pretty good for a venture firm. Um, the diversity is good. We don't think alike. We don't talk alike. Don't dress alike. Go to different things. Um, but we're good partners. Um, and we make good investments. And so I love the venture business because it's very, it's the most similar thing to trading that I can find where my skill set actually adds value and beyond the money.